All right, I'm going to dive in, and I'm sure that people will be, you know, coming and going as the roundtable goes on. Um, welcome. Welcome to this roundtable, which is titled Seconds, Please, a roundtable on publishing your second book. And um, my name is Deborah Wong. I'm a professor at UCR in the music department, and I'm suddenly aware that we have people with us today who are not necessarily at UCR, so I will try to offer some, you know, context um, on people and places as we proceed here. Um, I have loved putting this panel together. Uh, the six panelists you're going to hear from are folks who I have mostly known for quite a while and um, have learned a lot from, and I think you are going to as well. Um, I should say that the second book is actually a really broad rubric in the humanities and social sciences, and it often means the major project that usually follows, you know, a book that got you tenure kind of thing. So today our six panelists are going to address uh, not just publishing, but also the processes that got them through the work and into the work. You know, how they managed to finish a post-tenure post project is uh, where we're coming from today. We are keenly aware that uh, the so-called second book is a key component in getting promoted from associate professor to full professor. And these are some of the things that we're thinking about. Um, we are super aware that this is an obstacle course for many of us at mid-career, you know, sort of due to post-tenure demands, you know, which often disproportionately affect certain kinds of faculty members. Um, we are very aware of that. And in fact, as one of our panelists, uh, Professor Melissa Wilcox, um, asked the six of us by, by email as we were preparing over the last few days, I'm going to paraphrase her. She, she wrote to us, how can we address the mid-career doldrums and its link to recognized and unrecognized service on the part of all faculty who aren't straight, cis, white, elite men. So these are some of the challenges, right? And these are the stakes and these are the things that we are, are terribly aware of. We want to share our, our experiences. We want to share our practical advice for moving forward with a big second project that will carry one straight into uh, being a full professor. Now, as far as we can remember, the last time a second book workshop was held at UCR was, I think, in 2017. And this is when uh, Ken Wissaker, uh, the well-known executive editor from Duke University Press, uh, came and gave such a workshop. And it was extremely useful. And I, frankly, still draw on, uh, you know, some of the advice and ideas that he offered at that workshop. Um, personally, I've been really happy at UCR to see a kind of ramping up of professional training and resources offered to pre-tenure faculty on our campus. There are things like, you know, the, the CIS redraft book manuscript revision grants, for instance. Um, there are, there's more and more faculty mentor pairings going on. Uh, there's the amazing work of the Women's Faculty Association, you know, a lot of it directed towards pre-tenure faculty, and I think it's made a real difference. I also hope that some of those models can be more directed at this point towards mid-career faculty because uh, we have needs and, and, and we can see uh, the demographics of who um, are full professors at UCR. Uh, those demographics remain disproportionately male and white. And I can, I can attest to this. When I go to meetings that are for full professors only, um, I am often the lonely only in the room, <laughs> the only woman, the only person of color who's a full professor. Right. All right, we need to get into it, but some practical matters here. Um, we're recording. We are recording this meeting um, for posterity to share afterwards. It will be archived through the Center for Ideas and Society. We just want you to be aware that we are recording. Um, we will mute everybody. We already have. Uh, the panelists, don't forget to unmute yourself when you speak. Um, Q&A at the end, and we hope we'll have 30 minutes for this, will be managed by um, typing questions into the chat window. And frankly, I would encourage you to type in questions throughout. Don't wait until the end. You know, as questions occur to you, put them in. Um, at the end, if you want to ask a question more directly, you know, in person, not in the chat window, please raise your hand in the participant window and um, we'll call on you. I want to thank the amazing sponsors of this event, uh, the Center for Ideas and Society on our campus has been, you know, such a home and supporter for so much of our work, 
I'm not just when I say our, I don't only mean those of us in this panel, you know, but generally within CHAS and beyond on our campus, uh, the Center for Ideas and Society is so important to us. Um, and within the CIS, the sponsor for this particular workshop is the Faculty Commons Performing Difference Work Group, now in our second year, uh, led by my treasured colleague, Professor Liz Shabilsky, who is doing an amazing job with it. Our panels today, they are six. They are Dana Simmons, Associate Professor of History. Could you, there you go, thank you. Uh, Jennifer Hughes, Associate Professor from History. Waving is good. Dylan Rodriguez, Professor of Media and Cultural Studies. Uh, thank you. Alcoin, uh, Chair of, of the Academic Senate here. And Thea Kraut, Professor of Dance. Professor Will, Melissa Wilcox, who is the Holstein Family and Community Chair in Religious Studies. Setsu Shigematsu, Associate Professor of Media and Cultural Studies. And I'm Deborah Wong, and I'm a professor in the music department. Okay, let's do a round robin. Let's do a round robin. And I'd like to e hear from each of our six panelists. Um, I'm going to exhort you to be concise. We we are academics. We love to talk about this stuff. We have a lot to say. It's all important, but I'm going to urge you to be concise. It's against our natures, but please be concise. All right, so here's the first big sort of out the gate question, and I'd love to hear from each of you. Uh, whether it was through content or through critical questions, how was your second book or project related to your first, or was it? You know, and compared to your pre tenure big project, uh, what felt different? about you know working your way into the second book uh let's start off with i don't know with dana let's start off with dana could you unmute yourself yes. as you answer hi am i good mm -hmm. um thank you so much for this invitation um i feel like i should be on both sides audience and speaker because my second book is not out <laughs> it's not even completely done um but i, I will um be concise how is it different um I spent a lot of time running away from my first book. Um, and now that I'm reaching the end of the second book, I'm realizing that I didn't run very far. Um, but uh, I spent time rebuilding collegial relations, sort of changing field, but above all, um, spent a lot of time um, after the first book trying to build community in which I wanted to work. Uh, so that for me is the most fundamental difference. I felt very alone writing my first book, my second book, thanks to many of the people here um, on, in all of the windows, um, has felt like a community project. Wow. So running away and finding community. Jennifer, Jennifer Hughes, how about you? Yes, hi. So um, it's good to be here. I have two different medical appointments this morning, so I'm um, in my car for the next 20 minutes, um, not driving, but apologies for any background noise. Um, I um, felt uh, my second book thematically um, built on threads from the uh, first book, and that second book I've just sent revisions, the revised manuscript to the publisher a week ago Saturday, so I'm still uh, reeling from from that um, process a bit, but um, I, I, I felt that writing the second book was in, in a way a more solitary process, so very different than um, than, uh, than Dana maybe in that way, um, and I did feel like in a way I was building on things I knew, but every book has its own trajectory, its own biography, its own um, uh, path forward to completion and this one is about nine years and um, uh, I felt in some ways um, I was starting all over again um, in doing it. So. Thank you. So it was pretty different for you. Wow. Dylan Rodriguez, how about you? Oh, so I think I took an unusual path toward the second book because um, after I finished the first one and went through the tenure process, well, actually, let me back up. Um, <clears throat> I think that we need to have a discuss, try to have part of this discussion focus on how to navigate second books if you are in a toxic department, um, or 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 just or just navigating difficult relationships professionally within your field or your department. Um, 
I'm in media and cultural studies now, but my first 16 years I was in ethnic studies. So I went, I went through quite a bit um, as I was in that department um, doing the second book. So the, the path to my second book was, was, was kind of, I think, unusual. Um, I would say it's a little bit weird. And it's, it's because I think throughout my graduate, um, my graduate school training, I was, I was navigating multiple fields through ethnic studies. And after I finished the first book, I went to some existing writing I had and realized I had several potential chapters for a second book already. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I revisited those over the course of the next year and a half, put them together. And I really, the principal thing in this is, is if you are fortunate enough and privileged enough to work with a good editor for your first book, my general advice would be to stick with that editor. Um, like I'm, I'm going to ride or die with Richard Morrison. He left Minnesota and went to Fordham and I'll, I'll, I'll go with him wherever he goes. If he starts publishing books off his printer, I'll go with him there. Um, because my experience with him has been so good. He understands my work. Like he knows who to send it to for external reviews and all that kind of thing. So, so that second, that path, the second book was, was facilitated by that relationship with that editor and the trust I had in that editor. So the second book came out really quickly because he got great external reviewers who gave great feedback. I went back to the existing chapters, which, you know, they were semi garbage, but I knew that. And that's what I was relying on, on external reviewers to tell me, you know, which garbage could be recuperated and which should be chucked out and burned. Um, and, uh, and that really, that really helped me. It really helped me to do that. And, um, and, and without that, I think it would have been much harder and much longer process. I'll stop. I want to come back to a number of those points. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, Anthea, Anthea Kraut, how about you? Yeah, so um, maybe similar to Dana, I think I felt like my second book was a, felt like a departure from my first book. And now I feel like the more I write, the more I think I'm just writing the same thing over and over and over again. <laughs> Um, Not true. <laughs> but I, what felt significantly different is the obvious fact that the first book was a dissertation first, um, which I think is pretty common. And so I researched it exhaustively. And so the second book felt really wide open in terms of what its parameters could or should be and how much research needed to go into it, which was both really freeing and really scary to just have to sort of make the choices myself about when to stop researching and you know what kinds of parameters I wanted to put on it. So that that felt like the biggest difference to me was having way more um, sort of what felt like agency which was again both freeing and scary in terms of what should go into the second book. Wow. Feeling freed and also having all the responsibility that comes with that, right? Uh, Melissa Wilcox, how about you? Okay, yeah, thanks to everybody for being here. I, I think this is my first webinar, so I'm super excited to be doing this. I'm in a little bit of a different position because my post tenure book was actually my third book. I spent six years flailing on the job market and frantically put together a second book proposal and then a second book that in many ways was a follow up. To my first one. So in writing my post tenure book, which is, although it's my third book, is really the second book project that we're talking about here, I was one of the people who felt freed to um, play in a few different sandboxes than I had played in before. I went out on a major limb working in a subfield where no one had yet gotten tenure in religious studies. To do my dissertation, got a lot of warnings about that, but also was very fortunate to have a committee that once they knew I was going into it with my eyes open, they were willing to have my back. So I was already taking risks, but um, was able to move in the next book, staying in the same subfield, helping to build it and establish it, was able to move into stuff that really grabbed my attention in new ways. I think like a lot of other people have already said, I've discovered the overarching themes in my research more in retrospect rather than following a, a clear path. But I often, I've become fond of joking that my research method appears to be something like running happily after shiny things. And when I find them, then I try to figure out what they are. And eventually I go, oh, that's related to this other shiny thing that I've been following. The other change I would say really briefly with the post-tenure book was that I also had more freedom in terms of the time. I spent five years just doing the field work and then discovered somewhat to my horror, even though I shouldn't have been surprised, 
that it takes a lot more time to process five years of fieldwork data than one or two years of fieldwork data. So, but that I think we'll come back to in terms of questions about service and other challenges in getting a book out mid-career. Thank you. Thank you. Really interesting and important points there. Um, uh, the pleasures of making discoveries as you go along, um, discovering that the time scale and the time frame is going to be different probably for the second book. Uh, Setsu, Shigematsu, how about you? You might need to unmute I yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my first uh, tenure book was on the uh, history and philosophy and politics of the Japanese radical uh, feminist movement. So in terms of continuity um, for my second and third projects, um, definitely the core of epistemology of feminist critique um, was the continuous element. But then in terms of what changed radically was the form and the genre and the fact that um, the second and third projects were more collective in terms of um, its creation. So I, I think my comments today um, are kind of uh, focused on trying to encourage, um, you know, everyone part who is part of this webinar. Once you, you know, are post tenure, then we are in the space when we when we can I think really think creatively about um, what we want to accomplish in the next kind of phase of one's career and one's life. And for me, um, you know, I identify as a scholar activist, but also very much um, as a feminist mother. So in terms of my second book, is second project, um, I ended up working on a, a feature length documentary film um, about the prison industrial complex and women in the prison abolition movement because I was, it grew out of some volunteer teaching I had been doing at a reentry home. And then um, I also then later after that was finished embarked on um, a children's uh, book series from an eco-feminist um, women of color perspective. So definitely my these second and third projects were very much outside of the uh, traditional kind of academic second book format. So um, in my, you know, further comments today, I would like to, you know, further talk about that and why I think, um, you know, we can consider that once uh, you are in the post tenure uh, time in your career. So thanks. I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, all of you. Um, oh my God, there's so many great issues already right here in front of us. Um, I encourage all of us, panelists included, to keep an eye on the chat because there's already great questions and responses coming through there. Um, uh, I'd like to turn to a few more, you know, sort of focused, focused questions at this point and, and call on, on particular panelists for, for these matters. Um, one, if it's a, especially a book, uh, one of the big decisions that many of us have to make uh, is whether to stay with the same publisher and whether at that point, you know, post tenure, um, is an advanced contract even useful at that point? I've been making my own discoveries along these lines with um, uh, the beginning of my fourth book, actually. So I wonder if I could turn to Anthea and to Dylan along those lines, because um, actually I'll turn to Dylan first, because you already made this very interesting argument that you found like evidently the perfect editor and you're going to follow him down whatever road he's on. So Dylan, tell us a little bit more. Um, do you want to know more about, about the, the, the kind of process of working with a specific editor or, or something else along the lines of the same, the same process or yeah, I just want to make sure my answer is responsive to everybody's. Uh, uh, we'll take it wherever you want. I think you already uh, shared with us this interesting idea okay. that it's not about the publisher. Uh, as much as for you, it was about an editor, right? Yeah. Um, okay. That's a, yeah. yeah. So go for it. No, that's that's an important point that I think Deborah just made, which that's your point, Deborah. So I'm going to go with that because I support that point. I think I think the quality of your relationship <laughs> with your editor is more important than what press you publish with. All right. So that's that's all presuming that you know you're you're you're, you're working with a decent press, right? But I think. Part of the problem with um, working in a research university is is folks get locked into chasing bullshit all the time. Mm -hmm. um, by which I mean, by which I mean, um, folks overfixate on one or two presses that they perceive to be the superstar press. All right, and 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 if you, for, I think for most disciplines and subdisciplines and fields that we're in, if you go back and look at some of the most important works that have ever been published. Um, probably the majority of them have not been published with those one or two superstar presses. They've been published with very good presses, 
But what matters more is the actual scholarship and the content and the critical interventions and the archival work and the research. So the, the substance of what you're doing is what you should really stand on, not the name of your press. All right. And, and I realize I'm saying that from a somewhat, you know, privileged position because I really my the presses I've published have been very good. Right. But I don't care about chasing Oxford or whatever. Right. And I'm, I'm not throwing shade at Oxford for y'all that are publishing with Oxford. I don't mean it like that. Um, what I'm saying, what I, what I, what I'm saying is that, is that what is really important is that you work with a press and an editor who understand and respect the intellectual and scholarly content of what it is you're doing, especially if you are in a kind of counterdisciplinary, transdisciplinary critical field that may in fact be challenging some of the established paradigms and methods, um, of, of, of your, of your area, which is oftentimes the case for second projects, right? Sometimes for second pro, and I would encourage this too. Probably the most liberating and different thing about the second project for me was that, you know, once I had tenure, well, I'm kind of wired like this anyways, but um, I just, I didn't, I didn't really, I felt, I felt like I didn't really have this kind of thing hovering over me um, of whether I was going to get retaliated against for challenging certain um, people and or, and or kind of paradigms and, 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 and kind of theoretical assumptions in my particular field of study. Um, so, so I think for many people, the second project is an opportunity to further liberate themselves from that um, sometimes internalized repression um, and, and, and be more explicit about their critical interventions. If you're doing that, it is even more imperative that you work with an editor and a press that understand your project and, and at a fundamental level support it, right? Even at the same time they're trying to get you to strengthen your argument, you need to work with a press and editor that, that fundamentally are supportive of your of your of your critical project and who understand it right that first prize is if they actually understand it um uh so i i would just encourage that for especially for the second book um because mm -hmm. because you know I, I don't think anybody should be sitting there extending the time toward the completion of a second major project uh, um you know book length project based on what press they want to work with um you know, if you're doing quality work, you're at UCR, you're doing quality work, you're going to get a high reputation press to publish your stuff. Don't chase bullshit. That's my takeaway. <laughs> Great advice there. Um, Anthea, how about you? Yeah, um, it's funny because I actually um, worked with Richard Morrison for my first book um, and then switched. So I have I don't know if there was a lot of thinking that went into my choice. I felt like um, my first my first editor inherited my project from his predecessor. So I'd never felt like he was super excited about my project. And then another factor was, I guess I'm realizing that each of my book projects have different interdisciplinary intersections. And so as I was sort of shifting which other field I wanted to be in dialogue with, that sort of shaped my decision. And there was a new editor who had come online um, and was very interested in building a dance studies list. And I think, but to echo what Dylan was saying, I wrote to this editor and he responded within like two hours to my initial inquiry and seemed really excited. And that was so, incredibly valuable to have I mean just first of all responsiveness is so amazing as in a working relationship to not feel like you're putting something out there and have to wait and worry um, but then also the enthusiasm and support for the project from from the get-go made the project feel um, it just felt it felt it felt less lonely. It felt like I immediately had an audience for it. That's beautiful. I mean, that you actually, you know, um, uh, that there's a certain process and conversation that was, you know, that you found with that, that editor. That's amazing. And that is, of course, what we want, you know, that kind of an interlocutor, um, you know, an informed, supportive uh, interlocutor as we move into that second project, right? I'd, I'd like to turn more solidly now, and, and thank you to Dylan and Anthea for, for sharing your experiences. Uh, we didn't get to advanced contracts, but we will later. I'd like to turn now to um, the matter of alternative, so-called alternative formats. I really want to push at the matter of, you know, whether a book, you know, uh, should still be held up as the, the normative, um, you know, expectation. But alternative formats, and I especially want to hear more from Setsu at this point, because you've been... Um, 
daring, you've been uh, creative, um, you know, how, when it comes to the matter of, of beginning to pave the way for the next promotion, you know, how do we make the arguments, you know, which in some corners of the university, it's still believed that anything except a book is an alternative format, right? So, so, so how have you begun to pave the way? How did you decide between, you know, the, the, um, the children's books, the Guardian Princess series, you know, the, the play, uh, which you haven't mentioned yet, uh, and the documentary? Tell us more. So um, I want to just, uh, I guess, preface my comments by saying, so, you know, uh, just reiterating. So now that, you know, we're not in the phase of survival publishing, right? I did, um, you know, take on these other projects that were not at all, I think, um, initiated with the thought, okay, how is this going to advance me professionally within the terms of the academic establishment. I wasn't thinking within that box. So that's where, you know, whether you call it daring, courageous, or, you know, idiotic, you know, I just pursued what I felt needed to be done in the world at the time. And in terms of, let's say, the, um, the film on prison abolition, I mean, I was inspired to do so coming from, you know, uh, the major, you know, prison abolition a conference realizing that they had there is no documentary that explains really what is um, you know prison abolition that could move beyond a college university audience and so definitely that documentary format was you know something that I was able to pursue collectively um, you know with a with um, you know many other makers who were uh, committed to that and then as for something like the uh, Guardian Princess book project for me um, I I love working with you know other people and then a project like that and turning it into musical theater provided, you know, wonderful opportunity to work with someone like, you know, Donatella Galella, um, who is, I think, also part of this webinar and in the theater department and um, also uh, folks in the music department, um, whether that was Ruth Charloff, uh, Tim Labore, to, you know, to, 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 uh, to work on these collaborative efforts along with also theater professionals. So in that respect, um, also the possibility of co-authoring, um, co-creating is also, I think, um, opens up once one is post-tenure. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, I would also um, want to just underscore the fact that, you know, in talking to publishers, yes, um, writing books in the humanities especially is what we're supposed to be doing, but then we also have to understand that in the digital era, um, books are being used less and less, especially by the up, up, up and coming generations and books are gen generally in decline. And so I do want to really encourage, you know, my post, my tenured colleagues to think about what are ways in which we can creatively um, open up to our, our knowledge, our research to new publics. To, um, to think about what might be more impactful genres, to think about, you know, what are other alternatives to the second book project. And all of that being said, I mean, I do think that the state of, the current state of our university is such that it's not always going to be properly evaluated, whether that's through CAP or even our own departmental colleagues, precisely because we're so, oftentimes so locked into this kind of traditional, right, second book, uh, second book format. And so uh, that being said, I do think that we do need to also work together at changing those evaluation processes, such as e-file, which are very much directed towards, you know, kind of traditional even science science oriented right publications and scholarly journals so i think that that is part of the work that remains to be done if we want to in a sense um work outside the traditional second book format um and um you know and and want that to be evaluated um in terms of its impact beyond um, our own scholarly fields so i'll leave it at that for now well said Setsu, oh gosh i so admire everything you've been doing um and i love what you know i loved everything you just said, but I especially uh, grabbed onto, you know, the points you made about um, how the second project may be directed towards different audiences, as you put it, new publics, right? You know, and that's, that's a, a kind of, you know, opening up that, that post-tenure is something that we feel more able sometimes to do, you know? Um, Jennifer, I'd love to hear a little bit from you on this point of, of, of alternative formats, because you yeah. too have been very imaginative. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, and I know we're going to talk more, Jane and I are going to talk more about the sort of writing communities um, mm -hmm. um, in the course of our time together. Um, I know when um, Erica, Edward, Erica Edwards and I um, 
started, we had just both of us been tenured and we noted that kind of as soon as you're tenured, there was a sort of drop off of um, conversation, right? About, you know, there's a lot of energy and com uh, a push and accountability around that first book, timeline to tenure and all of that, but then this sort of silence. And so we started working on this peer mentoring community, kind of mid-career peer mentoring toward, which we call the path to full professor. And I think one of the really beautiful things where we could think about creative terms and think about um, the, the power, um, privilege, and freedom that tenure affords to engage in different sorts of projects that maybe are, are more community-oriented um, and uh, more public facing. And so I spent, um, I spent several years kind of involved in various grant projects, um, including working on a documentary, making a documentary film related to those or doing museum or public history work, we could say, um, museum uh, curation and exhibition. And, um, that creative energy, I, I, I felt like that was one of the, the nice outcomes of um, that early iteration of, of a kind of mid-career um, group to say all of this is generative intellectual labor and it all is part of, of um, what we can do as uh, at this sort of mid-career stage and bring from here on out. And, so I felt like there was a lot of support in, in that um, community for, um, and space for thinking about uh, creative labor um, beyond the narrow parameters of the book. And um, those, um, that work really sustained me and um, um, was much more, I would say, collective and collaborative in its, in its vision. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, uh, and I, I should say that I, I do feel there's still so much work and uh, so much road still left to be uh, navigated, but I do think that there's been a, a, a sea change in um, an openness to public facing work um, on our campus. I immediately must say, I think we have a long way to go. Uh, and that the taxonomies of, of e-file and such work directly against some of those matters. But I, I do think that something is changing at the moment. And, um, and, and Jennifer, you've really been at the forefront of that. Um, I should also say that I'm gonna be on the Committee for Academic Personnel starting in July for the next three years. And I have everything to learn about, you know, the intricacies of, of you know, what's involved with that. But all of these matters are very, very, very much on my mind, very much. Um, I'd like to turn to the matter of work process. And I wonder if uh, 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 Dana, especially, um, and also Jennifer and Melissa could tell us a bit about your work process for the second big project. Um, did you belong to a writing group? I happen to know that you did, some of you. Uh, did you use things, you know, like colloquia, conference presentations, you know, to develop your ideas? Um, did you publish any parts of that second big project elsewhere before it became part of the book. Uh, tell us more, but Dana, why don't you lead us in? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I want to um, start by recognizing Jennifer as having founded um, the group that really, um, one of the two groups the, the, that really set the stage for this um, community oriented base, I think, of, of my work. Um, I want to put a pitch in for um, creating joining all kinds of collective of support and accountability. Um, and those can vary with different phases. I have found there are moments when I really need, um, you know, a group where I open Slack or whatever, and I, every day I write in what I'm doing. And then there are other phases when I'm so focused on writing, I don't wanna be reporting to other people on a daily basis. Um, but just to list some of the things that I found helpful, um, uh, a, a writing process group, right? A group, this is the one that I know many of us have been in these already together, um, you know, where you just talk about process and that can be in person, that can be, you know, electronically on Slack or another forum. Um, uh, another format is a reading group, right? Um, so um, another thing with some of the colleagues here today, you know, forming um, interest-oriented 
disciplinary reading groups where we pass around work. Um, it can be having a writing buddy. I remember um, one of our colleagues uh, talked about her process. She emails every Friday with a, with a friend and just sends what she's written that week. They just send to each other. They don't even necessarily have to read it or comment on it, but just to mark, you know, to see each other. Um, institutional, you know, frameworks like the um, National Center for Faculty Diversity um, and development. Um, or other institutional frames. Um, spaces to write together, I guess now on Zoom, right? Um, I've done all of those and all of those have been super helpful in different ways. And then finally, one last thing, which I, this year has been so wonderful in unanticipated ways is a manuscript workshop grant. And um, that was actually supposed to happen on Friday. I had it scheduled, um, but sending people a manuscript on April 1st just didn't seem okay. <laughs> Not that I was able to finish, but the previous weeks, uh, the previous months leading up to it, I've been writing in conversation with this group of people who I've chosen and invited and love and respect and having their presence around me. They haven't done anything yet, but their presence, I've been having conversations with them for months in my head. So, um, and that I did not expect as, a, as an unanticipated gift of having scheduled a workshop months in advance is that presence. Um, so I really, um, you know, big plug for, it, it's, not even, it's not even the funds necessarily to bring them together. It's, it's, it's having that sense of conversation. Dana, you've been so careful to, to explore so many different ways to, to, to move forward, to connect, to, to, you know, to create accountability. I just uh, really admire everything you've done. And the fact is, you haven't done it only for yourself. You've mostly done it for the rest of us. And I've been the direct, you know, uh, beneficiary of all of that. And I wonder if, um, if Jennifer, uh, if you could speak a bit, a little bit more about uh, uh, creating that workshop three years ago, four years ago, uh, for peer mentoring and um, acknowledge that the much missed Erica Edwards was part of that. Jennifer, unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. Um, technical uh, things. Yeah, so, um, and I'm also reading some of the questions that are coming in. Um, Me too. Over, yeah, over text and um, so might um, address some of those. So, um, I want to also plug the, the um, book manuscript scrub or the book manuscript um, gathering, which you can do with and without funds. I mean, I had a small grant, I think it was $500 and I, from CIS, um, uh, but that, and having that deadline was, you know, and this vision of creating something that I could share with a particular Will she come back? <laughs> oh, Jennifer, we've lost you. Um, let me go on to Melissa for now. Melissa, could you, you know, address your work process? Uh, yeah. As to, yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm in some ways the opposite of, of a lot of the people that have talked about their work process so far. I'm a very solitary, if not even monastic writer. I've also, um, I basically was shunned out of my last institution. And so I, I have a tendency to get gun shy around communities and friendships nowadays. Um, I'm also one of these people for whom that, that great trick uh, that's working for some of my grad students who had writer's block of doing an hour every morning, completely impossible for me. It takes an hour and several bags of chips just to even get the ideas flowing. I, unfortunately, this is not a good way to be a writer in terms of all of the demands on our time, but I can only write with full days. Um, and sometimes it's, it's like 12 or 18 hour stretches or longer. Um, I have, I've written with and without children. I came to treasure the time after 10 o'clock at night when everyone was in bed, no one was on email, no one was calling me, everyone left me alone. So if I can manage to stay awake into the wee hours, that's often how I write. Um, 
I wanted to address a couple of the questions that people have been asking uh, in the comments thread as well. And I'm going to say I have I can't track the comments thread and talk at the same time. So I've missed the more recent ones that have come in. But several people have asked questions about um, balancing. How do you figure out how to get the book out and still manage through merit reviews? Because, of course, when you're focusing on research, you're not depending on what your work is. There are a lot of us who are who are just doing the research, whether it's data gathering or, you know, burying ourselves in archives or whatever. It's all a form of gathering data, says the person who's trained in a bunch of different fields. Um, it's really hard to write when you're doing that. You don't know that you have anything to write about. It feels too raw. It feels too fresh. Um, and yet there's this merit review system. And how do you get that work out? even when it's starting not to feel too raw or too fresh and still be able to get a book contract. So for me, um, I'm also, I've been enough out in left field for long enough that it's very rare for me to get really helpful generative feedback from conferences. They, or even workshops, there have been some, and I have a research group here, that is not about my writing, but is people that I work that I learn from um, on a regular mm -hmm. basis. But um, what conferences have become have always been for me is an opportunity to to articulate my ideas. Each time I give a paper, I actually I don't recycle papers. I write a new one each time, even if it's on a lot of the same topics, because I find that I refine my ideas through that process. Then I try to get a couple of things since a publication. With my dissertation, it was a chap. It was it was a chapter, and then it was another um, piece that was sort of a combination of a couple of chapters. With more recent books, it's been um, particularly with the book that was my post tenure book. It's been initial articulations of the argument, and in those cases, those have not been publishers. The guideline I was given years ago that I've never seen violated is that publishers will generally allow you to get away with approximately um, two chapters, no more than two, of your material already in publication and not the exact same thing. So an early draft, an early version. And when I do these sort of initial articulation type articles, I've never had a publisher balk at those because they're different from the material in the book. Yeah. I, I... If it's a, I'm back now and in my home, so thank you. That was awkward, but it's been an interesting week. I also have a broken arm, so I'm <laughs> managing a lot of things. But I, I just wanted to um, chime in and to say one of the things that um, I had been working on when I was on the um, Faculty Welfare Committee, and this responds to a number of the chats that have come in, is trying to have um, completed chapters of a book in progress count for merit and promotion. Um, I've been working on that for almost three years and we've um, put this proposal, um, uh, as Dylan knows, <laughs> um, two or three times and we're trying to get it exactly right so that it will pass and pass easily and be accepted as a practice. But um, um, because the idea is that the arc of a book, the arc of completion of a book is different than for an article and that you can have work in progress um, count precisely so you don't have to defer your merit um, review, right? So that is, I think, a justice issue that Eric and I had identified as really critical. Um, in my case, none of my book chapters have been published. Um, uh, my articles were really quite quite different than, than the book. Um, uh, so, Yes, that's what I wanted to add. Thank you, thank you. Um, and, and to both of you, um, Melissa and, and Jennifer and Dana, I wanna just sort of say thank you for, for being so forthcoming about your own experiences. Uh, Melissa, I really appreciated the way in which you, you know, offered how your own writing process you know, doesn't fit the kind of neoliberal factory model that's being pushed on us these days of write an hour a day every day, you know, just be productive all the time and constantly, you know, that doesn't work for you, you know, and thank you for just sort of, you know, putting that out there. Uh, and, and also the fact that, um, you know, who we turn to, you know, the strategically, our circles may narrow or may open up depending on our needs in any given moments as, and, you know, conferences may not serve the same kind of purpose that they did pre-tenure, right? You know, so these kinds of things are really useful to, to hear. 
important to understand and to think about. Um, I'd like to turn to one more round robin where we hear from each of you uh, before we open it up for um, questions and to address these great things coming through in the chat. And thank you to some of the panelists for actually trying to address some of them as we go along. Um, a big sort of uh, question for all of us. Um, Mid-career challenges and advantages. Uh, let's try not to get stuck in the challenges, but, but let's also face up to them. Um, but how did both the challenges and the advantages affect how the project proceeded? over a certain number of years. I'd love to hear from each of you. Let's go, I don't know, in the same order, I guess. Um, Dana, could you lead off? Sure. Um, so I guess one thing I would say that um, I found useful, I have not always succeeded in any way, um, is at least to attempt to orient my priorities with respect to everything I do within the institution around what I want to achieve in my you know, overall research care complex. Um, so there's service, you know, service, <laughs> teaching, um, both of those. Actually, I remember a presentation by Catherine Kinney a few years back where she actually went through and suggested that it's differential commitment to teaching time, not just service, right? That's a real challenge um, and that breaks down a court, you know, along the, the usual suspect lines. <laughs> I don't need to list them. Um, we know them. Uh, you know, those things trying in any way to feed each other so that service and teaching and research feed each other. That was one of the best pieces of advice that I received as a way, also as a filter, right? If it's not feeding what you want to achieve and accomplish at the institution or with the complex of research and care, that you are concerned with, you say no, right? I mean, saying no, having a no committee, that's a useful um, collective to establish. I never managed to do it, but I, I like it in my head. It's a group of people you email when you get asked to do something. You email and say, should I say yes or no? And it, it, that step of having that distance and consultation um, to permit it is super useful. Um, so that, um, now I've forgotten what else, what else I wanted to say, um, but uh, that 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 attempts to you know be true to one's priorities. It's really hard, especially when those priorities can be orthogonal to institutional priorities. Um, but it's a survival mechanism. Well said. Thank you. The no committee, great idea. I'm looking out at my panelists and seeing a bunch of people who say yes all the time to all kinds of things, but yeah. <laughs> I know, I'm totally hypocritical. <laughs> like I said, like it's a great idea. I try and have it in my head. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jennifer, how about you? Um, yeah, I think, you know, there's a kind of, um, I, I felt, you know, like I said, this, this book that I, I finished, and, you know, um, mostly, <laughs> it's had a kind of arc of sort of lulls and ups and downs, I wanna say. Um, I had actually, because of the, my um, grant on festivals, had thought I was going to co-author a book with a, with a colleague and then that fell through. <laughs> and then I came back to this project. Um, and, um, and I also had been very active in sort of campus leadership and, and in terms of academic senate and was vice chair of the senate. Um, there is a way in which I felt that finishing it, everything kind of had to go silent, <laughs> you know, like the last two, three years, two and a half years, I would say, as I moved to, to this. Every, yeah, I just felt like everything kind of has to go quiet so that I can get this done. And um, so I didn't pull back completely, but I had to pull back from quite a lot, you know, and just sort of put my, put my energies um, there um, in a different sort of way and I'm trying to think about this balance between community and individual and, and sol solitude right because it takes a lot a lot a lot of alone time and I got six people in the house right now <laughs> so um, it's a it's a you know this sort of really um, difficult balance and sort of an ebb and flow and a rhythm, not just of the day, but of the, of the, the, the project overall. Um, you know, so 
um, if I had managed to, you know, I also changed departments, right, as I was kind of beginning this um, project and that um, slowed it down. Um, but it's a different, very different book now than it would have been if I had published it three or four years ago. So um, uh, anyway. Yeah. No, thank you. That's, that's, that's very thoughtful. Yeah. Um, Dylan, how about you? Another example of a colleague who changed departments, you know? Yeah, no, that was totally involuntary, you know? Um, but, but it's actually part of my response to this question, which is that uh, something that something that I that I had to that I had to navigate throughout my time um, in my in my first department, my original department, was for the vast majority of the time it was an incredibly densely hostile um, hostile department. Uh, you know, part of part of part of the the work that I think we need to generate out of this conversation is an ethic around building um, not just not just an institutional community, which I think we have the roots um, or may, maybe a catalyst for doing through this discussion. Like maybe these 25 people should create a listserv and just be helping each other out, supporting each other and just having each other as a sounding board. I think that's just just that by itself is incredibly useful and helpful and and would have helped me a lot, actually, during my first like eight years at UCR, mm -hmm. um, because what it and here's why it's because what it does is, is it informs the people who would otherwise like to see you die. Um, that there are eyes on them from outside the department, right? Right. No, no, knowing that, oh, this person who I am invested in, in destroying is actually connected to this whole network of people, right, throughout this particular university campus. Um, so, damn, maybe, maybe I need to be careful because those other people will put me on blast and hold me accountable for my toxic and repressive and unethical behavior. Um, uh, that's... That's an ethic I think um, we need to build out of these very practical conversations about second book projects is that is that for many of us, the thing that's going to that's going to enable the execution and completion of a second project will will probably be some version of the kind of community I'm talking about. Right. So I think if we were a little bit more explicit and intentional about doing that and saying um, and I'm not necessarily talking about institutionalizing it in a formal way. Right. But I'm just saying just let it let it be a kind of institutional practice and politics. Um, among those of us who care enough to be here on this call, that that there's a connectedness between I'm just gonna like Chicago, right? Because I like her back screen. Um, like if 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 Chicago is connected to this community of people, then then everybody that is engaging with Chicago already knows that her work and her scholarship is valued by all these people in the university. So that's that's one institutional point. The larger point I wanted to make too is that the thing that's really kept me afloat in the context of navigating you know different forms of institutional hostility has been keeping in mind what um, one of my graduate school mentors, Angela Davis, told me like the, the, first, the first month I knew her, which is um, she told me to always consider all of my organizing work and activism as my research, right? She said it is, it is false to posit some kind of um, artificial dichotomy between the things you do because you have a, you know, a sense of responsibility and obligation to do them and your academic scholarship and research, right? And you can translate that to whatever you want, right? It could be for folks who are different kinds of practitioners, translate it to whatever form of practice, you know, you're talking about. It doesn't have to just be the scholarly activist types. Um, but but I, I, take, I took that to heart. And what it also, what, what, it, what it then translated into is that um, I've been privileged to be connected to different kinds of communities of practitioners, thinkers, scholars, activists, artists, and others who extend way beyond UCR and way beyond even the academy, right? Mm -hmm. So once I have that, that actually feeds my that feeds my writing, my thinking, my scholarship and so forth in a way um, that 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 empowers me uh, to kind of navigate and push back against the different kinds of institutional repression, you know, and the different obstacles that are here. It also makes me more creative. Um, so so I would say just take advantage of that. And also the fact that once you do get tenure and you're working on your second project, all y'all get invited to stuff now all the time, don't you? Like you get invited to review people for tenure, you get invited to do keynotes, you get invited to do campus lectures, you get invited to conferences, that people want you to write um, articles for special issues of journals. Um, so, so all that stuff can be, it can feel overwhelming, except I'd say if, if you're selective and strategic about it, that, that all those things should be considered, again, part of your broader totality of research and thinking. And, and as things that feed the second project, even if they're not directly related to it. I'm telling keynotes, like even reviewing somebody for tenure. I can tell you all, all that stuff has fed everything that I do in my writing. Like I oftentimes will reference and cite a book that, and don't tell anybody this, I never even read it once it was in published form. I read it when it was in somebody's tenure file, 
<laughs> right before it was published, when it was a PDF of 350 pages. But I'm citing it now. Um, and I, you know, again, you're sworn to secrecy. Probably, probably close to 50% of my citations nowadays of books are, are things that I've only ever read in somebody's tenure file or, for, or, or full professor file, right? I never, I, I own the hard copy of the book, but I've never actually opened it because I already read it or, or you know, the, the previous version of it. Okay, sorry for talking so long. <laughs> no, as always, that was incredibly useful. Um, you know, and I especially love the way still and you really urged us not to, um, you know, allow ourselves to be isolated, contained, you know, feel that we're working on our own by ourselves. Yeah, reach out, create connection, refuse some of the binaries that, um, you know, create boundaries around what's our work and what isn't our work, right? Um, um, where are we at? Uh, Anthea, Anthea, how about you? Yes, are we talking about challenges or rewards or both? Both. Okay, um, I guess I had, I had two kids when I wrote the second book and had no kids when I wrote the first book. So that was a challenge, but I think it made me a lot more, um, well, basically, I was really lucky to have a fellowship year, and I just figured out, worked backwards, and knew I had to have all of the writing done by the end of the fellowship year, and so worked backwards, and it was basically like a chapter every 10 weeks, and I just stuck to that <laughs> timeline. Um, I will say that the one of the things I'm learning to appreciate just about having done this for longer is that I just have more of an acceptance of what my writing process is. Um, similar to a little bit what Melissa was saying, like I, I, I'm a painfully slow writer. I don't think I've ever written more than two pages a day, literally in my whole life. It never flows out of me. And I know that I have to sit, I have to have five days in a row and I have to sit down every day for five days in order to make progress on something. Um, but I feel a little bit more just that's my process now and understand that. And so it's waiting until those conditions are there to, to get something done. So I feel like just self-knowledge is um, knowing your strengths and knowing your limitations and just knowing your process has been one of the big rewards of just doing this for a longer period of time. Yeah. Thank you. That was really useful. And you reminded me that it's just about time for um, some kind of roundtable on the uneven impact of COVID-19 on, on academia and especially at UCR. So that's another, another matter. Um, Melissa, how about you? Ops, yeah, uh, so advantages, disadvantages, mid-career. I'm going to go with disadvantages first so that I save the best for last. Um, and I want to, th there's something really important for me here. I've been passionate about mid-career mentoring since I realized that I should have had it and didn't. I made a lot of mistakes, so I try whenever I can to say things to people and say, don't do what I did. I think that we all get messages when we are working towards tenure, at least those of us who are in departments that are at least somewhat supportive, that people are shouldering extra burdens to protect us so that we can get our research done. And I think that that instills a certain kind of guilt and a certain kind of expectation that there's payback when we get to associate, when we get tenure. So, um, and also, um, like I think many of us here, both on the panel and, and, and everyone else that's here with us, have, I have a lot of commitment to underrepresented communities, I, especially at a small liberal arts college, especially because I do queer studies and religion, the number of hours I have spent behind closed doors with students who are grappling with gender identity or sexual identity and religion at a school that didn't have a women's center prior to the more recent interpretations of Title IX, again, probably like many of you, the number of hours I've spent behind closed doors with sexual assault survivors, all of that really matters to me. What I did not know to do when I got to associate was to temper all of those commitments. So I drowned in service. I completely drowned. Um, I have the advantage or disadvantage of being, I think, fairly good at administration. I'm very organized. Um, I get very anxious when people ask things of me, so I respond to email right away. Um, please don't abuse what I just shared. Um, but I was able to do my field work 
with a child and with those commitments, I was not able to write. I wasn't even able to process the data. I wasn't able to transcribe my interviews. I wasn't able to review transcripts other people had done for me. I got to the point where I couldn't even finish field notes because I was so exhausted. I would get back. My field work is often late at night. I'd get back to a hotel room at two in the morning and literally fall asleep with my face on my laptop while I was trying to write field notes. And then the next morning I couldn't remember anything. I had a sabbatical. I dropped everything cold and I refused to pick anything up when I got back. That put, and I've written about this in case anybody's interested, that puts you in the really difficult situation of having to choose between throwing your colleagues under the bus and throwing yourself under the bus. And this is where I think having a supportive department, if you can, is really, really helpful because there can be conversations about balancing that kind of thing. Um, I, one other thing I wanna add, again, if you have a supportive department, a good chair can also serve as your no committee. I have volunteered to do that when I've been a chair, particularly but not only with um, tenure track faculty members to say, um, look, if you get asked to do service and it's something you don't wanna do but you feel like you can't say no, at a small liberal arts college, those requests sometimes came personally from the president, especially for faculty from underrepresented groups. Just tell them your chair said you're not allowed to do service. If you want to say no and you don't want it to be your responsibility that you're saying no, blame it on me. I tell my grad students the same thing. Super quick rewards. Um, extra time. I know that there's a merit system. I wasn't up against that when I was, I'm only in my fourth year at UCR, so I wasn't up against that when I was writing my post-tenure book. But at the same time, I was up against the timeline for full and I was trying frantically to get out of the institution I was in. But being able to be more creative, being able to not have the same intense timeline, I think allows us to follow threads that we know are interesting, that we know are promising, without as much having to justify to anybody else until we know why they're interesting and promising. And that's put, at least put me in a situation where I think, I don't know, how some people are, are still like, really, you're still talking about that thing. but. I think I have a lot more to offer my field now than my first two projects did. Wow, thank you. Thank you for being so forthcoming. Um, I want to read what the, the article perhaps that you just mentioned that you had published on these matters. Would you I'll, mind I'll maybe- find the link and post it. Put it in the chat if you think of it, if you can just pull it up. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, mid-career challenges and, and advantages. <laughs> Those two things are awfully closely related, aren't they? But Setsu, how about you? So um, I'm keeping my eye on the clock because I know that we want to leave uh, ample time for Q&A. So I'll just uh, try to keep this free as possible. Um, I think that, um, you know, going back to our state of being post-tenure and the demands of service and, you know, child rearing and, you know, all of these other commitments that we then need to balance. I just think that for me, um, uh, only at this kind of late stage of being like a associate for a long time, I've realized that, okay, I was not interested in the race to full. That wasn't a priority for me. Um, and I think that once we become clear about like how we think about our priorities, what do we want to spend our energies um, on in terms of making, I think, the most effective impact. I think but then once we're clearer about that, then we can, you know, not feel like we're in such, you know, this kind of um, academic accumulation pressure cooker all the time. And that's always a struggle because of the culture of being like um, among so many, being myself, a wor you know, a, a workaholic still. But, you know, pre-tenure, I was a kind of manic workaholic, right? So I do think that once um, the advantage of being, again, tenured is I think we can be somewhat more thoughtful, right? Again, about how um, we are even doing our service because yes, we can say no to things that maybe are not as meaningful, but I think saying yes to what we care about in our university community and is, you know, is considered service type work or mentoring of students and whatnot. I mean, saying yes to that, you know, it's a part of what I think Dana was talking about, about our, you know, research and care complex that we are kind of, in a sense always trying to balance. So I'll just leave it at that because I'm also really interested in um, hearing what other folks uh, in the room want to uh, ask about and comment on um, for the rest of our time together. So thank you. Thank you. And I actually said, so I love what you just said, you know, the way you, you, you indicated that it's, um, 
Uh, it's about beginning to realize, you know, how, how deeply connected uh, where we want to go is, is, is um, imbricated with the communities that we want to be with. Um, yes, uh, let's open it up at this point. Actually, I'm going to go out of gallery view. Boom. Look at all these great faces. Um, and uh, invite questions from any of our attendees uh, who I see are at many different stages of the process, who are at different institutions and so on and so forth. I'm frankly not sure how to proceed at this point because we have any number of like fantabulous questions in the chat window. Um, and I'm not, I'm guessing that to go all the way back up to the top uh, is not the most effective way to proceed. Uh, panelists, do you have any suggestions about how to, how to proceed? Are there any questions, here, here we go. Are there any matters in the chat window that you would like to address yourselves right now that are perhaps slightly different than what we've already covered? Panelists. Uh, can I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Is there any way we can help with the effort to get book chapters to count for merits? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, that um, if that, uh, if you want to reach out to me separately, um, I think, you know, there's two things is one to, um, let everyone know it's in the works. So, um, um, even bringing up at the level of departments so that there's some grassroots support for that. Um, uh, Jason Weems and I, um, one thing that happened was that was in, in the works and then I went on sabbatical, Erica Edwards left and Jason Weems um, was no longer chair of Academic Senate. Um, but um, I think it's something that ha is going to need to have widespread support, right? Um, once that proposal comes forward. And that was one of the things that, that Dylan and I have been working on, right? Which is to get the proposal right. And in a way we had to start all over again, right? Um, um, to move that forward. Um, but if, if we set up a beautiful proposal, we still need academic Senate committees to approve it. We still need the, the VPAP to move forward. We need the deans to say it's okay. We need the chairs to say it's okay, right? So there is this sort of um, uh, ground of support that has to be in place as the Senate goes through its process to make this recommendation. We even said, let's do it as a pilot, right? Um, they do it at Berkeley. It's the standard practice at UC Berkeley. So we've been working on their model. Yeah, and even in addition to just um, the evaluation of book chapters, I'm just wondering uh, if other people have thoughts about, you know, the general right merit and promotion process and how, you know, what type of publication is valued versus, you know, the kind of incredible amounts of like service work, um, community building that uh, other, our, our colleagues do. So that's just kind of just opening up that question a little bit wider. Um, That is the question. What counts and how? Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell you what, tell you what, I'm seeing we have about 20 minutes left. I'm seeing that various uh, attendees have had to run off to one o'clock things. Um, how about this? Those of you who are still here, uh, please ask questions and feel free to repeat anything that you've already put into the chat, simply because there's so much that I, I can't begin to call through it at the moment. So, I turn to you, attendees. Hi, this is Ali. Hi, Ali. Hi. Um, I ha thank you so much for, for everything. Uh, I was struggling to, to write and publish my first book, you know, out of dissertation. You know, it took years to really um, shape my first book. My second book, uh, I felt like more, you know, you, you have more freedom, right? Because it was from dissertation, you know, but now I have more freedom. However, I still feel like I need more college supports. Like, for example, reading my chapters. How do you feel as colleagues, you know, as senior colleagues to read a draft of the chapters? You know, would you feel like, okay, uh, you know, I'm too busy to, you know, to read this a draft or something, how would you feel to read your, you know, junior mid-career chapters or drafts so that you can help shape the, the, our book in, in progress or our manuscript in progress? 
So I would like to ask about that. How would you feel to respond to kind of request to read your chapters? Uh, you know, your 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 like my my chapter, for example. Hmm. Ali, clarification by colleagues. Do you mean that in the broadest sense, not just folks in your department, not yes. just you know, yeah, okay, yes. yeah. broader departments, not necessarily in your own fields, you know, um, oh, from okay. right. Okay. Well, I have strong feelings about that, but I turned all, Anthea. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, the privilege of being in my, in my position, I feel like my sole purpose now is to help other people exactly. um, advance. So I, there's nothing I want to do more than help other people. So please, please, please ask. Okay. Yeah, I feel like it's a responsibility we have at this point, Melissa. So I'm also chair of Ali's department. I would be honored. I'm always honored when I'm asked for that. And I share the reluctance to ask. I never know how to ask that of someone because I feel like it's such a big favor. So I'm so glad that you just put that out there so that those of us who do have that ability can say, yes, it, it would be an honor. Yeah, anybody else want to respond to that? Dylan. Sorry, I was using the raise hand function in the um, in, in the oh. participant thing over there. Okay, I'll um, you. Yeah, no, that's all right. Uh, sure. No, I was, I, Ali, I was going to say real quickly and to all y'all, yes, I do it all the time. And I do it beyond my field um, mm -hmm. all the time. Uh, I, again, I think I just echo, I, I, I think about it as both a privilege and an absolute responsibility if somebody asks you. Yeah with not a little bit of paying it forward because folks did it for many of us, if not all of us. Yeah, yeah. Great Thank question. You. Thanks for asking it. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions, other observations? There's a question in the comments thread, Deborah, just so you know, about COVID-19. Oh, let's see here. Um, uh, from Victoria? There yeah. you are, Victoria. Yeah. Uh, can you think through all the impact of COVID-19 on these processes? Yeah. Um, do you want to elaborate? I mean, I think I know where you're coming from, but... but No, um, I just think that, um, you know, especially we know that there is a disproportionate impact of kind of um, child care, elderly care, all kind of emotion, uh, labor and care labor, and, and just thinking through um, how that could impact the process of the second book, what is it, you know, I'm, I'm particularly thinking about people who were in the middle of being in the field or experiments, um, more so that I'm lucky I have all my data for my second book, but I can see how the abrupt stoppage of their work, you know, and even if they're, you know, and writing a book, right, if you're still kind of collecting data or if you're kind of in field work and, and just if, if people could think about their thoughts and what that means for the merit process, right? Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, those are the questions. And, you know, obviously uh, 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 higher ed responses to these matters are changing by the day as we all sort of think this through. Um, I, I know that, that it, it expanded 10 year clock uh, opportunities are being discussed ev everywhere. I hope at UCR as well. I don't really know. Um, maybe Dylan and Jennifer can speak to that. Um, yeah, John, Dylan. Uh, just just to respond directly to um, uh, Victoria's question here, I, mean, I, I could probably give like a thirty minute lecture on this at this point. Um, yeah. yeah, but but I'll say I'll say two things. One one broadly is that what what Victoria's question raises is I think the need to overtly and consistently challenge all these discourses of a new normal and normalization and so forth that are coming forward primarily from administrative um, origins. You know, um, it's, it's something that I've been confronting um, pretty consistently here at UCR. Um, in these, these last, last months I have serving as our Senate chair uh, is there, there's a push, sometimes, in, sometimes unintentional, and, and, and more disturbingly, very frequently, very intentional to try to push the faculty to treat the current conditions as if they need to get used to them. Um, and, and I think we have to refuse that. I think we have to refuse that and we have to um, uh, be very open about the fact that the kinds of inequities um, are asymmetrical. That, that the, the, the inequities that are created by the pandemic and the conditions around pandemic are asymmetrical. And it's, 
both along the, you know, they, they tend to exacerbate all the asymmetries along, along the lines of race, class, intersexuality, and so forth, right? But they also create new asymmetries among people who do particular kinds of research, for example. Some people can't do their research at all, right? And then there's other folks who can't do whatever writing and, and um, creative and, 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 and performing, performing uh, uh, works that they're used to, they can't do it at all, right? So um, what that actually means is that because we're in these profoundly abnormal conditions, research for some people actually just fucking stops, right? There's no, there's no sugarcoating that. Like, it just stops. Um, and, I, to be, and, and I'll be dead honest, I don't think institutions, not just UCR, but academic institutions, universities, they don't have, at this point, um, an, an, adequate, an adequate fluency in dealing with that. I think they're actually just in denial, Right. That they're all holding their breath and just waiting for all this stuff just to suddenly go back to normal and everybody's back in their lab and everyone's back in the performance, in the performance hall and so forth. And so forth. that's that's not the case. So I think in response to what Victoria is saying, aside from like the kind of logistical parts of dealing with merit promotion adversities that are created by the pandemic, I think that there is a discourse of institutional normalization that we absolutely have to see and we have to challenge it all the time. I mean, I heard one dean here at UCR and I locked horns with them right away. Um, because I had, I was thinking about everyone here, right? I was like, what if all these folks on this call were watching me in this meeting? What would they want me to do? Um, uh, which makes me really brave, by the way, because I know people have my back. Um, but, but this dean was actually saying, this dean was actually saying, you know, um, challenging me, actually. And they were saying, if we don't, if we don't pr uh, um, communicate a message of normalization, faculty will get lazy and they will sit on their hands until June when everything's back to normal. That's almost verbatim, you all. Like I'm, I'm. That's it's not verbatim, but it's almost verbatim. And that's not. I'm not exaggerating. I know people think I'm prone to exaggeration. I am not exaggerating that. So anyway, thanks for asking that question, Victoria. Um, I I wanted to just say, Deborah, that Liz uh, a while ago said um, she couldn't raise her hand, but had a question. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to flag that. Um, wait, Liz, are you still here? Yes, Liz, yeah. could you just simply ask it? Sure, yeah, I have no idea what's wrong with my video. When it's on, you don't see me. But um, I was curious, what I, my experience of writing the first book is that there's this external artificial timeline. And then when that goes away, how do you know when you're done? <laughs> what a great question. <laughs> Anyone, how would you like to answer it? I had someone tell me um, that when you're further research won't change your argument is when you know you're done, which I worry now that I'm taking way too liberally because I feel like I already know the argument for my next book without having done enough research. But that was a helpful guide for me in terms of um, my argument isn't going to change no matter how much more I work on something. Um, I don't know if that's that's more related to the research than the writing. The writing for me was just done when, when my time, the time available to write it was done. Maybe we could come back at this point to the question about contracts and advanced contracts because- Thank you. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and I know this is free range from COVID catastrophe down to like the minutia, you know, but is that? Um, <laughs> it just is what it is, right? Um, yeah, yeah, go for it. I mean, I, I wanna say that I think what Liz is at, like, I think that is the key issue. And all, like, this could become a labor without end, um, right? Because you, you don't have these sort of timelines. Um, um, and I think departments can do more in terms of supporting, doing, doing more at the department level to talk about the second book and the book process and having more conversations like this one. But I also think that the advanced contract can can give you a nice timeline and deadlines, right? Like I really have worked hard with this. I have built in all kinds of crazy deadlines. I blew through every single deadline. I did not meet a single one, but I always had crazy deadlines, right? And so the, the, the date of the manuscript um, um, meeting, that was a deadline deadlines with the publisher. I, I didn't have an advanced contract, but I think an advanced contract can do that for you. And then, you know, reaching out to, um, you know, with the book proposal and beginning a conversation with an editor, um, trying to establish the kind of rapport that Dylan was talking about so that you have these sort of structures of accountability and, and deadlines. Um, and um, 
I think also knowing when you're spinning your wheels and you need to stop and move on to something else, another part of your book or another chapter, another section was really important to me for the second book, right? Like stop, you know, so um, I think there's ways to, to build, build those in. And, and then the last thing I wanted to say, my experience with this current book is I wrote a, a friend, a, a brilliant colleague, and I said, Vince, I was like, I finished my book. And then I went on to say what was going to happen next. And he wrote back and he said, isn't it funny how many times you have to finish a book before it's actually published, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> I felt like when I gave it to my manuscript committee that I had, quote, finished it. And then when I spent a couple months revising, gave it to the press, I finished it. And then I, you know, I revised it according to the reviewers and what I want to do and it's finished, but I know there's still more to come, right? So, but each of those deadlines um, artificially created or whatever made all the difference. Like, so when I was blowing through NYU's first deadline, I still loved the deadline, right? It's like, okay, I'm going to blow through it, but um, I, and I have colleagues who don't miss, I have one colleague who doesn't miss deadlines, but um, deadlines can be your friend, even as you blow through them. That's what I want. Yeah, I just to sort of drive your point home, Jennifer, um, you know, we are offered different timelines and different sets of deadlines in, in a number of ways. This is why belatedly in late career, I'm finding an advanced contract is really useful for precisely the reasons that you just laid out. Um, and, you know, the merit system, like it or hate it, you know, does create certain kinds of, you know, accountability structures that can keep us moving if, if that's what we want it to do for us, right? So, so Liz, there's not one answer to your question, not that you thought there would be, but it's a great question. Yeah. Um, let's try and slide in one, if not two more questions. And I'm seeing that there's some great questions about advanced contracts over here in chat. That might even be a, a I don't know, a separate workshop at some point. Other questions? I turn to all of you. Again, I'm not able to sort of really sit down and peruse the chat right now. So if anyone would like to bring up something you've already put in there, now's the moment. I just want to say one thing with um, all of the discussion about the merit system, and I will confess right from the beginning that although I have a deep family history with the UC system, um, my own experience as as a ladder rank employee only goes back four years. Um, but one of the most valuable things my doctoral advisor ever said to me is something that he probably had no idea was valuable at the time. It was in a conversation in a seminar that we were co-teaching because as a postdoc, I wasn't allowed to teach graduate seminars, but he wanted to give me the opportunity anyway, so he co-taught it with me. And people were talking about, oh, that's a pre-tenure project, that's a post-tenure project. And he looked around the table and he said, there will always be another carrot. And I just, I'm terribly responsive to carrots. I wish I weren't. I hate the fact that full is not the top of the mountain at the UC system because it means that I will keep chasing the carrot. I hate that I do that. But I always have in the back of my head Clark Roof's voice saying there will always be another carrot. In other words, as much as you can with acknowledgement that that's not always practical or possible, as much as you can resist the carrots because we do our best work when we allow ourselves to do the work that really matters to us and not that matters to the system. Well said, Melissa. Yeah, yeah, well said. Um, just a few minutes, low stakes, low risk. One more question, bring it. Okay, I have a question. Can Jane. everyone hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, if your second, if you have a second project that is kind of, would be for a broader audience, what are the pros and cons of potentially looking to publish with a trade press rather than an academic press? Fantastic question. Well, gosh, a little more people will read your book. Full, I have a colleague who got full with a trade press biography. Okay. Yeah. In history or was it something else? Yeah. History? Biography of Dolly Madison. But it was oh, a, right, of course. Oh, well, that's Catherine Hogmore. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, got, no, I think I, I never heard of you ever heard of anyone getting denied full professor because they went with the trade press. 
I don't know. You know, that's the crazy thing is they only care if it's cardboard, right? <laughs> I mean, it's such a strange frame, right? <laughs> like of all the things, it has to be cardboard and then you're fine. And I think it's kind of fancy to have a trade press. Like, it's kind of cool, you know? <laughs> like, I, I wish I could get like a trade press, you know? <laughs> Yeah, again, more people will read it. <laughs> yeah. And you can also spin it as public facing scholarship. So to whatever extent that is rewarded, I and mean, obviously the, the public facing scholarship argument always has to be done carefully because it depends on the context. But I think I think in, in yours there's there's gonna be a lot of support for that. So, you know, trade press is a bad word, but public facing scholarship isn't. So I so much of this is about spin. Can I follow up with that? Um, yeah, Victoria, please. Thanks. Uh, so I think that's great. I wonder whether public, because I do a lot of public scholarship, but it seems like it's less valued, right? So in a more supportive department, the department would take the lead and, and you and yourself statement about framing why this is important and this is scholarship, et cetera, et cetera, which is what like trade publications and, and this kind of thing to get at, at Jade's question um, in less supportive departments, right? It's all about the framing and, and that framing helps think about how reviewers will review it. So I guess my, my question slash point is whether public facing scholarship is actually less valued for these kinds of promotions and merits. Um, yeah, so I would love to hear from more senior colleagues about that. Mm -hmm. Panelists, would any of you like to? For me, that's one of the main motivations for getting to full myself mm -hmm. is, is to push for opening more space for precisely that kind of work. And, I, and there are tons of people already up there in this, in these windows who are who are doing it um and you know i i um it's an it's an ongoing project i think it's still extremely important for each of us to make the argument for ourselves you know about why the work counts why it addresses new publics to use uh setsu's phrase um you know how it's about expanded audiences and readerships and communities uh, make the argument um, even if if your immediate circle of the department doesn't uh, get that argument uh, the file is still read beyond the department right so so you know the argument will, will be made beginning with you and then repeatedly hopefully yeah i think i i think we need to wrap i'm so happy to see so many of you are still here um, I'd like to thank our panelists who are just like have so much accumulated experience, commitment, uh, wisdom. Uh, thank you. Thank you for making the time today to be with us to share your, your experiences and your, your, your ideas for better futures. Um, I am going to uh, have the chat window saved, you know, as a text file and shared with all of us and in fact anybody who, who wants it. Um, we didn't get to next steps because there's always next steps. Minimally, there should be a workshop like this, you know, every every year or two years, I think, with some frequency. Um, but there's much we can do to um, to advocate for ourselves and as a community, right? So again, thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank for you, Demra, us. for organizing this. Great this was pleasure. wonderful. Thank, thank you so you. much, and for sharing yes. for sharing the conversation. I learned a lot. So yeah, it was me too. Good. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. See you sooner rather than later. I hope. Bye. Bye.